Good afternoon. I am Ted Hans from Internet2, and I'm the chair for this session on e-learning. We have three presentations covering uh, different aspects of uh, e-learning from uh, the issues around middleware, uh, digital libraries, collaboration tools, and e-learning around grids. Our first presenter is Sally Chambers, who's the coordinator of the University of London's Libraries Electronic Library Projects team. Sally? Hi. Before I start, as uh, Ted said, I just want to make it clear that I'm a librarian. And when I was filling out the um, conference uh, evaluation form, it was interesting that librarian wasn't on the box. Maybe that's something for next year. Today I'm going to be talking about our online library for the external program. And here's an overview of what I'll speak about. What exactly is the online library? As I've been talking to people at the conference, people get different ideas of what an online library, online books, online journals, explain exactly what that is. Tell you a bit about the student community we serve within the University of London. As it's an IT conference, I want to tell you some of the IT issues that having an online library has raised. So why do we need usernames and passwords to access online library materials? If we didn't have those, it'd make my life a lot easier. Then I will talk about the usernames and passwords that we use in the online library and look towards the future of what we'll use later on. So let's start. What is the online library? It's a website, plain and simple. It contains links to full text electronic journals. So instead of a student going to a physical library and photocopying the journal article they need, they can download it either in HTML format or in PDF format. Instead of books, we catalogue web resources that are, have been chosen by our faculty or academics and catalogue them as a book would be in a physical library so that they can be used as part of the studies. I'm sure you've all been to a library and looked up reference information in dictionaries, encyclopedias. We have those in our online library as well. From the very beginning, it was very important to us in the library that we were able to help the students use the library resources effectively. So we have an electronic help desk to help them use the resources, providing them lots of online information to help them use the resources for their studies. If they still need further help, they can contact us via a web form, email, or even the phone, and we can help them further. So, just an idea, we haven't got much time, but just an idea of um, what the online library looks like. As you can see down the left-hand side, here are all the databases for the students that contain the electronic journals. Over on the right, we have the catalogues of subject-specific web resources. Here is the links to the reference library in containing encyclopedias, dictionaries. And here is the help desk with information about using databases, an online library induction tour. I'm sure in the university library you've all seen at the beginning of the term hordes of students going round the university library. We do that online. And links to the inquiry page. So, who exactly is the online library for? Well, I represent the University of London, but a little known fact about the university is that we have an external program which offers both postgraduate and undergraduate courses in over 180 countries around the world. We have approximately 30,000 students, um, with 24,500 of those being undergraduate students. 
This pie chart gives you an idea of where our students are based. If you can see the Western Europe section, 17% of those are in actually Western Europe. And out of the 24,000, um, 24, about 4,000 are actually based in the UK, and not many of those actually in London itself. As you can see, Asia Pacific is by far the biggest category of users that we have. So, as you can see, our students are very unlikely to ever visit us in the library building itself. So, having an online library has created various IT issues for us and for the students. What exactly are they? Firstly, as you can see where the students are based, not all of them have good internet connectivity. It tends to be that they will log on and the connection will break halfway through. So if they're downloading electronic journal articles, particularly the ones in PDF, this can get very frustrating for them. Another issue we've come up is that unlike university campuses, where we have system administrators to look after the network and um, look after the applications that, that students can use in the computers in the university. We have none of that. All our students log in from all over the world using their own software from public libraries, from internet cafes, often from work. And therefore, accessing e-journals causes a, has a problem with personal firewalls and, and pop-up blockers. The Google toolbar causes us a lot of problems. You want to block the ads, but it also blocks our e-journals. Some of the students are not used to using IT. A number of inquiries we get with various students saying, I'm just not used to IT. I don't feel very good at IT. I don't feel very clever. This does cause a problem for accessing the online library. For example, one of our e-journals requires that we have JavaScript enabled on the web browser. Not all students know how to enable JavaScript. And because of the error messages they get when they try to log into the e-resources, it doesn't make any sense to them at all. However, the most area that we get inquiries from is about obtaining and using usernames and passwords. As you can see from the slide, 75% of our inquiries are about usernames and passwords. I'd say that that's quite a few. As a librarian, I was never trained to answer IT inquiries about usernames and passwords. I was trained to help students discover resources that they need for their studies, how to manage their resources effectively. Can I be a proper librarian again? So, if 75% of the problem is caused by usernames and passwords, what should we do without them? Why do we need them? The majority of our e-journals are actually purchased on a license agreement from the resource suppliers. Therefore, with the, with the license restrictions, e-journals are only available for University of London students, and it is my job as the librarian to ensure, as far as possible, that only University of London students access the e-journals. On campus, I don't know in your campuses whether this is the same, but we would just simply register the campus IP addresses with the e-journal supplier. Therefore, students can go through the access control mechanism without even noticing. However, IP access cannot be used off campus without having a proxy server or B VPN in, in place. Initially, we wanted to use a proxy server to um, just enable, just register the proxy server's IP address with the e-journal supplier. We thought it would be that simple. Unfortunately, we fell at the first hurdle. We may look back at it again, but we tried a different route, which I'll explain later. Another way of providing off-campus access to electronic library resources is using the supplier's usernames and passwords. 
However, we have several thousand different journals with quite a few different suppliers, each having their own username and password. If the students are studying on their own, the other side of the world, students on campus have difficulty enough remembering the, the usernames and passwords without being isolated and being on their own. It's not really a solution that we could use. So, what did we decide to do? We were very lucky in the UK that we have the Athens Access Management System that is developed by EduServe in the UK. This is a system that provides a single username and password to allow electronic journals for multiple suppliers. In that way, we don't have the lots of different usernames and passwords for each of the individual publishers we subscribe to and provide us our electronic journals. Athens system also allows location independent access to resources. When we looked at the, prop, the idea of registering IP addresses, we initially thought, could we register the IP addresses of the students? 30,000 IP addresses of a minimum potentially. Don't fancy doing that myself and I don't think the e-resource suppliers would want that either. It also allows librarians who, like myself, may be non-technical, to administer access to their resources via the web. I feel that's very important from a library point of view. Some libraries pass their Athens administration to their IT departments, and I realize I'm talking to a lot of IT people here, but in an ordinary library, we look after the access to our books. We don't outsource it to another department. What's the difference in an online library? So, using the Athens system, we have one online library username and password for most resources. Even though EduServe had done an excellent job about negotiating with suppliers and encouraging them, them to use the Athens system to provide their usernames and passwords, there are still some resources that don't use the Athens system. We still have to have separate usernames and passwords for each of those resources. Overall, it is easier for the students. They only have to remember the single username and password. And we try to keep the same username and password for the length of their study. But when we have the one or two e-journals that do use a, name, do use a different username and password, that can be confusing and perhaps even more confusing if you're used to using just the single username. Also, creating and distributing individual usernames and passwords is time consuming for librarians. Athens have developed a bulk upload system so you can upload them using an Excel spreadsheet. But because of the nature of our students and the information that we record about them in the student registry database, Unfortunately, that simply isn't possible for us. Also, as part of the, on, the, the online library is part of a wider project called the eCampus to provide virtual learning environments and other online resources for students to study online. They also have a different username and password for this. This is something we'd like to reduce in the future. So, usernames and password solutions for the future. We have three phases. I hoped that we'd be able to sort this problem out overnight, but it takes, it's taken a lot longer than that. The online library went live in September 2001. Still, this username and password problem creates 75% of the inquiries. It is going to take a long time to solve, and therefore we have to do it carefully in stages. Phase one, students can register online for their Athens username and password. We set up the user groups in advance so that we can keep an eye on which students are registering. But they can do it for themselves and then takes the burden out of the librarian doing it. However, because we have to do this online and also have to do it from an IP secure location, 
we have to use proxy servers. And we did spend a long time making an online username and password registration system. It probably takes about 15 minutes for a student to create a username and password on their own. All they need to know is their student number, have an email address. We don't, in the University of London, external program issue um, college email addresses for the students, so we're often dealing with Hotmail accounts that change quite frequently. And they have to know which course they can do. However, because of the long process, 15 minutes, if you're on an insecure co connection, if it goes down halfway through, the process is finished. It's caused a lot of problems and a lot of our inquiries about how to use the online registration system, even though we provided extensive help information. Therefore, we don't think that self-registration for Athens usernames and passwords is the future solution that we're looking for. Phase two, we'd like to automatically create usernames and passwords for the online library resources using a, I think, I've, I, think I like the term, second generation access management system. What I mean by second generation is that it can connect directly with the student registry database. For example, Athens have a system called devolved authentication, which can use the university's LDAP directory in order to create um, virtual username and passwords behind the scenes so the student doesn't actually need the username and password. They can use a local username and password, perhaps, perhaps their own name and a, a login that they choose. This would automatically be created when a student registers and in the same way when a student deregisters, the system would be able to tell us that the student was no longer with us, so we can revoke that username and password in order that one of our regulations is that non-university students cannot use the university e-resources. Getting rid of accounts after they've been created is sometimes more problematic. So, our ideal is that we've implemented Athens DA, for example. How can we combine that to log into other applications, for example, the virtual learning environment? We're still investigating that. We really need to get our directory structure. And uh, one of the meetings yesterday, we're going to look at the UK EduPerson and see if we can get our LDAP to fit in with those standards. But this is going to take a while. However, we'd like to use something like Shibboleth in the future so that other applications, the virtual learning environment, can be used and they only have to log in once for anything they need online. Here are some links that you might find useful. The first one, the online library link, may be a bit confusing when you log into it. We have multiple courses and unlike a normal library website, there's a separate home page for each of the different student groups that we work with. So you'll have to choose a student group to look at when you first go in. The second one is the University of London external program. Even within the UK, even within the University of London, not many people have heard of it. So take a look. We have 30,000 students. See what you think. The last two are the second generation access management systems, Athens DA and Shibboleth. Thank you. Do we have questions for Sally? Have we considered a select? Um, I um, go to the tea face meetings. Um, maybe something we'd look at in the future. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you.
Our next presenter is uh, Juan Quimada from the Technical University of Madrid. Uh, he's a professor who's been involved in collaboration and collaboration technology for over 10 years now and will talk to us about the Isabel project. Okay, thank you, Ted. <clears throat> well, I'll present to you uh, the result of many years of experimentation in making collaborative experiments and also developing application. I have called the, the presentation an application, or is it an application for real-time audience interconnection over the internet, but you could substitute also audience interconnection for collaboration. I put audience interconnection because this is precisely the point where uh, we have obtained very interesting results with Isabel. Okay, let's see what is Isabel. Isabel is more than an application, what is called a meta-application. Uh, it's a, a service creation environment hmm, for real-time services. Hmm. The development started very long ago. It started in the hot times of ATM, uh, when the big demonstrators were being built, and we developed Isabel for doing uh, experiments over it. So it has been developed over the RACE program, ACTS, and IST. Uh, you can find more information here up in this URL. Hmm. The goal when we started uh, this work, and uh, the goal which we have still now, is uh, to provide effective interconnection of audiences. This means interconnecting rooms like this, this one mm, all <laughs> over the world or over, over a given region in order to allow collaborative activities mm, in room-based environment. Also, uh, well, the technology is also applicab applicable for collaboration over the desktop or for individual persons. Mm. So, uh, well, the use of, of having classrooms connected or meeting rooms or so is one of our key objectives. Mm. We also wanted to take a benefit of, of broadband networks just with ATM. We were always IP, but we were IP over ATM. Uh, we worked also over uh, satellites with broadband connections and finally over the Internet. Mm. And um, our second uh, and most important goal was to work in multi-point environment, hmm, where we could connect uh, platforms with many endpoints uh, <coughs> all over the places. Hmm. Because point-to-point -point communication and collaboration is relatively easy, but when you go to multi-point, multi it gets more difficult. Hmm. Here you have, well, many captures from all, this, all, all the events made during all these years. So a short history is as follows. We developed the Isabel service concept in the, what was called the Race Summer Schools on Advanced Broadband Communication from ABC 93 to ABC 96. These were four summer schools. In the first one, in 93, we connected two sites. This was our first experiment. This was really a very, we could say, low-level experiment. But in 94, we went to five sites the next year to 11, and the next to 16 sites, connected all over the world. Mm. Uh, in these projects, we developed a service for making distributed congresses or conferences. Mm. Uh, from then on, we started developing Isabel as a service creation environment over which uh, we could design other services. So we, decide, we designed a service for having something like corporate telemeetings or project telemeetings, this was under requirements of Ericsson in a project of, uh, of ACTS, which was called um, uh, <coughs> TECODIS. Mm? And we also have uh, developed services for distributed classroom. Uh, since uh, year 2000, more or less, when we ported all the technology to the PC, we have started to consolidate it and to uh, do more intensively uh, <laughs> courses, workshops, and conferences. So we are doing probably uh, quite a few dozens of events each year uh, during uh, this year and the last one, and, and the activities are increasing. In this last year, the technology has got uh, quite mature, I could say. Well, in order to understand what we do, the best is seeing an example. I will show two examples. The first one is a distributed conference, and the second one is a distributed course. Uh, well, uh, the conference I will show is something which, is, uh, which we call the Isabel 10th anniversary event because it was done 10 years after our first experiment, the first race summer school. It was a one and a half day workshop 
But we had uh, between 10 and 20 sites connected hmm, all over the world. Uh, uh, the sites had auditoriums. Our auditoriums was the largest one and had uh, 120 attendees. Our auditoriums had about around 10, or that's 40, 50. Hmm? Uh, we were using IPv4 and IPv6, unicast and multicast, most of the technologies which exist to, today in the Internet. And the speakers and chairs of the conferences were approximately in 10 of the sites. Hmm? The content was the typical content of a workshop, talks, presentations, and panel discussions. And if you are interested in this URL here, you can find all the presentations and all the video recordings mm, of the sessions. Mm. I will show you just a grasp mm, of, of some of the sessions. Mm. These points, these yellow points, were all the sites connected. We had many sites in Spain. We had CRC in Canada, in Ottawa, uh, also. Uh, we had uh, in Colombia University and in Chile another one. Uh, these are captures. This is the, the auditorium at UPM during a panel discussion. Here you have the speaker and the rest of the members of the panel. Uh, here we had, yes, all the sites participating at the end, all still connected. Here we had the site of Bilbao where you can see the, the participants and uh, during, a question, during the questions after a session. Let's go to see... Uh, videos which show much better how this happened. The first presentation I will show you is in Spanish, but it shows very well how a presentation goes on. Can you put the sound louder, please? Well, okay. This, so this is the introduction of the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we were, uh, I think, at that time about 13 or 14 sites, but the, the application selects, yes, the chairman, I was chairing the session. Then uh, we changed to the presentations. Then we insert the typical elements needed for a presentation. You have the speaker above. The chairman, here you have a semaphore to, to mark the time, such the speakers not don't go over the time, because chairman and speaker can be in different places. And here you have the slides, mm, the control of the slides. Mm, and basically, if we go over the recording, well, you see this is a typical presentation. Mm. The sound quality is not very good. Mm. And, and okay. So this is a hand raising mode. Mm. Then you see a question coming from Malaga. Sí. Mm. Sí, sí, sí. Puedes hablar. Puedes hablar. ¿Qué tal, Susana? Pedro Merino de Malaga. Okay. So it continues. You see, this is the question. Still continues. This is a question from Madrid. Then we have. Era un poco relativa a que en la exposición que ha hecho Azucena, pues quería preguntarle hay un tema que. This is a question coming from Bilbao, from the north of Spain. Well, they interact, and then at the end, well, we have here another mode. And, uh, well, finally a picture of all the, the videos of the sites participating at that particular instant. Mm? So this shows how a presentation goes on. Our idea has been to reproduce exactly the mechanics, the roles, and, and the, the patterns you have in usual conferences, but in a distributed environment. Mm? So there was one conference. I will show you now very shortly the second well, session the of the afternoon. Is, uh, mm? dedicated to the digital processing this is in of, uh, English. Uh, mm? Images, uh, medical images. And then so the speaker is now in Barcelona. Platform. The chairman is in Madrid. And, uh, mm? other partners mm? like, uh, and so this goes uh, on. Provider, uh, here related with to, uh, well, you have now the speaker in Murcia. This is the next speaker. Mm? And the chairman in Madrid. Murcia is uh, 800 kilometers to the south from Barcelona. So we were iterating. 
He continues. I mean, this video is a two-hour recording, so it's a fairly long, but I will not, of course, play the two hours. Mm. You see, this is a slow speaker, so the semaphore has got red. Mm. It has been marked for Madrid to Murcia. Mm. And, well, he goes still for a while, but now they go to the question session. I just got to like to, see, to make a, a, a summary in order to center hmm? the information you have so given us uh, for the, the, the debate. I think on that uh, you hmm? have uh, mainly uh, talked about security on IPv6. Hmm? Uh, we, uh, we must be aware that there are other issues in IPv4 as well that I think is good to remark, well, mainly for the audience. I think she speaks for a while. My question is very you see, the question you have has been taken there. The, for hmm? the debate. I think that uh, you have uh, mainly uh, talked about security on IPv6. Okay. You thinking deeply about how to promote and how to work. She speaks a lot. She's a chairman who speaks a lot. But he has taken the question finally, which was coming from another participant. Mm? And also because mm? we can have really peer-to-peer -peer communication. Well, it we goes on. Then you have here another presentation. Uh, mm. This was in Madrid, the speaker in Madrid with the chairman in Madrid. Mm. The web. Well, he continues, he was explaining the semantic web. Mm. Example, this is a workshop of tutorial nature. Well, this goes for a while. Mm. You see this. Mm. This is becoming now an item. This is the question. Mm. And then we get next well, the sound has here something strange in that this was not okay. very good. Now, also, the portal supports the exchange of different kinds of learning resources, well, educational materials. So the speaker is now in Paris and the chairman in Madrid. That, mm? that can be delivered in a, well, um, and so it continues uh, mm? until the end. Mm? Let us applause, uh, when we finish the session, mm? we get to this picture and then we go to the break in all the sites and continue again. Well, so this is an example of a distributed conference. This was an event which had a, a one and a half day duration in which we all were connected and having a distributed conference like we are having here today. But all distributed, speaker, attendees, panelists, etc. Um, let's see another example. This is a, a course we run among four universities in Spain. Uh, well, I belong to the Telecommunication Engineering school, school of the Technical University of Madrid, and this course is run between four telecommunication engineering schools. Mm? It is a school which is inserted in the regular curriculum. We include, uh, I mean, this included, and the students can take it as any other course. Mm? It is given by professors in the four schools. The advantage we gain is that, well, we give a course which is 60 hours lecturing, mm? Uh, but we only have to lecture for one-fourth of the time. Mm? Uh, it has 30 students in each of the schools. Mm? The material are exchanged over the, uh, over the web. Mm? We have web collaboration tools to exchange. The classes are recorded, as you have seen in this recorded, as you will see now in the next slide, and distributed over the web, such as students who could not attend to the class can see the class later. Mm? Uh, the most interesting thing and the things which a student likes most is the coursework. Mm? Uh, the coursework is organized as follows. Uh, we wanted to take the paradigm of distributed collaboration to the end, and so we formed groups of three, each in a different school, mm? uh, so they cannot meet. They have to work over and collaborate over the Internet, and then they have to make a work, a joint work, uh, which they have to defend over the platform, which is just an oral presentation over Isabel. One student makes the intro, another uh, presents the core and the final, the conclusion, or three parts of the work. Mm? Well, so this is the platform, and I will show you this part of the defense. Mm? Here we are using... Mm? Vale, ya, well, ya are, Carlos the students si are preparing before this. Mm? Well, then they start. Mm? Me llamo Luis Manzaneca. This is the first student who has started to present. You see, he continues. He's working with IPv6. Well, here we have changed to the next student. All are presenting the same work. And this is the third one. Mm -hmm. 
well, emigrar la aplicación, como os acabo de decir, no. eh, al final, lo lógico es emigrar la aplicación a este uh, pero si no se puede utilizar todos los métodos. Eh, the students, mm? Ventajas entre uno u otro. Bueno, y esto continúa a lo largo. Y así se va. El curso tiene dos tercios, que es lecturing, y un tercio, que es la presentación de trabajo. Las cosas más interesantes, y las cosas que los estudiantes les gustan más, es esta parte final, donde tienen que colaborar y colaborar para realmente presentar su trabajo. Esto es muy interesante. They are very nervous usually because they have never spoken through such systems, or at least very few of them have done it only. And it is for them a very exciting challenge. And it improves all, it, it helps them to improve communication capabilities, which are not usually well developed, at least in the universities in Spain. So these are the universities we connect. It's in Barcelona, Valencia, and two of them in Madrid. These are captures from the various years. This course has been running for four years now. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. Okay, so these are examples which show very well what we do. What are the main features of Isabel? Mm? Well, Isabel is an application to perform distributed event, mm? a network collaboration with audiences, so also we use also we could say for we could say desktop communication in some cases. Mm? Uh, the main requirement was that any site can host any type of participants. I mean, speakers, chairs, attendees, panel members, etc., etc., people making demos. This, uh, it, we had something like a peer-to-peer. -peer. Any site can play any role. Also, we didn't call it a peer-to-peer -peer application. We designed it with the following visual features. Uh, all participants must share the same view of the event. Uh, we consider this fundamental and users tend to agree with it because so all participants have exactly the same view of the event. What we are recording is exactly what each participant is viewing. When the mode changes, it changes synchronized in all the sites participating. The second important uh, characteristic is that the, <coughs> the application, as you have seen, has visual messages inserted. Mm? It has something like a TV-like production where only the active sites are visible. Mm? The problem which exists with today's video conferencing is that you cannot see the, the sites which are active. You can see usually one or all, but not just the few which are active at a point with a proper uh, visual message. Mm? And so we designed these visual messages mm, to support the various types of collaborations in each of the services. Mm? Uh, this leads uh, and introduces the main uh, characteristic of Isabel, which is the flexible floor control. What does it mean? Is that uh, it has a very flexible and programmable floor control, which is based on interaction mode. Each one of these configurations has we call interaction mode, and the service is a set of interaction modes you can change in a very dynamic and easy way. Mm? Each interaction mode supports a given type of collaboration, one the presentation, one the questions, which is very difficult in a distributed environment. And so each interaction mode is a proper configuration on the screen of all the media which are used. And it supports also something which is very important, which is the rules and roles of presential events. Something we have done and we have tried to mimic here is a support for all the rules and roles which exist, for example, in conferences, that is something to support the, the function of the chair, of the speakers, of the people who make questions, and so on. And so you have here three examples of, of interaction modes. Hmm? Uh, presentation, well, you have here a, a highlighting one side with a big video, and here the question mode you have seen already before. Hmm? Here we have three examples of, uh, of the main services we have developed. The telemeeting, this is a very easy to use. And, and flexible, where any site can request being the master and make a presentation, put his video in big, or make a, uh, or be the master of a question session. We have a teleclass, which is a mixture between a centralized and distributed control. And finally, the teleconference, which is fully centralized control. After many experiments, we got to the conclusion that you can have only a good conference if you have centralized control and the <coughs> change of, of between speakers and sessions and everything is controlled by in, at a given point. If you allow the people to interact, you have usually a mess and you can have not a properly designed and well-performed conference. Okay, so the architecture of this application is very simple. Uh, the most important component is the session control integration. We have a very sophisticated control pro protocol 
which unifies the management of media. Mm? The pro control protocol is the protocol which exists among the managers. Mm? This is one terminal, this is another Isabel terminal, and these managers are, uh, are uh, controlled by the panels. Mm? The, these are where are the buttons. When you click, signal goes to the manager, then he sends signals to the rest of the terminal. He sends also signals to the component which manage the multimedia streams. Mm? And so this provokes the reconfigurations of the scenarios dynamically during the event. Mm? We have another very important component, which is uh, the flow server. Uh, which is something which is extremely important because the Internet today has lost the end-to-end -end connectivity. There are lots of problems, lots of barriers. There are NAT devices, there are um, firewalls. You have multicast enabled in some parts, only unicast in another. And so this flow server is something like a proxy. It's also a gateway between unicast and multicast. It's a flow merger. It's an MCU which allows to create platforms to have these large multi-points over the diversity of services and things we have in today's internet. Mm? So if we go to what a collaboration session is, uh, here we have a typical collaboration, it's a small collaboration, just five sites. The collaboration will take place with one of the services, the telemeeting, the teleclassroom, or a teleconference, and then you create a platform with those functions, with, <coughs> it's, uh, with PCs where you have Isabel installed, you need Isabel installed in one PC in each of the sites. Mm? And the Isabel PCs, they play roles. Hmm? Here you have just interactive terminals. Interactive terminals are for participating. It's a role for participating, for being one of those interactive sites. You need one site, which is the master, which is the entry point to the conference. It's just for, uh, the master is the site which defines which service will be used in the session. And you need also uh, flow servers. For example, here to integrate these two terminals connected over a multicast zone with those other two uh, connected over the unicast, mm, or unicast connectivity. Mm. So flow servers play a, a big number of roles. Flow servers are integrated in the terminal, so this is just a PC which is running three roles simultaneously. It's an interactive terminal, it's a, it's a master, and it's a flow server. Mm. <coughs> well, we have other platform components. Mm. One, we have one streaming component, which we call the antenna. It's, it's like a webcast. Mm? Uh, it's a different, it's, it's not exactly streaming, because we provide full graphics resolution, and uh, we adapt the frame rate uh, to the bandwidth uh, available at every site. Mm? It, uh, we have made it also very uh, safe in order that it can pass NATs and other devices. It just uses uh, two TCP connections. Mm? This is the, the URL where we usually make the webcast of our events. Mm? We have also a recorder which uh, records in MPEG-4 the videos which you have seen uh, have been recorded. The videos you have seen were in fact the first, vi the first videos we recorded because the rec we got the recorder ready last, uh, last October. Mm? And this uh, workshop I've shown you was the one, first one we recorded. Since then we have recorded all of them. And we have also gateways to allow participation with a SIP video phone or with an H323 uh, like net meeting or whatever mm, into the Isabel conferences. Mm. So here you have a more sophisticated platform where we have well, here a flow server which is a dedicated PC which just acts as flow server. This is very uh, recommended when you have large platforms. Here we have the master of the session which is connected over Unicast to a flow server. Uh, several interactive terminals, some of them connected over multicast, some over uh, <coughs> unicast. And then here we have this web antenna, the streaming, uh, the SIP gateways, uh, and so on. And so this is a typical configuration of a platform. Mm? The typical size of the platform is between uh, a couple of terminals till uh, 30 and a little bit over. When you make interactive collaboration, having more than 30 participants, does not allow really interactions. I mean, if you would like others to watch it, they should uh, watch it over the antenna, but uh, the interactive size, should, our experience should not cover over that number. Mm? Well, some of the control, the management goes over TCP, and the media flows, they go over UDP. <coughs> well, here we have um, more or less uh, the view we have now uh, of Isabel. I mean, we have evolved during all this year without really having the target hmm, of, of uh, having something like a greater structure 
to something which resembles very much the grid. Hmm? So this is why we tend to call Isabel something like a collaboration grid now, because basically we have PCs where Isabel is installed. These are these resources here. Then this, those PCs can take roles under the control of a given uh, uh, management uh, element, hmm? which is this web management which exists here. So when we create a collaboration, we have a web server, which is the coordinator of this session, hmm? which acts in close collaboration with the master. Hmm? And then we have developed a technology which is based in XML and web services, such that this uh, web manager can, uh, well, <laughs> launch and stop and manage all the platform. Not only the platform, also the network services used. Hmm? For example, he can connect the terminals uh, or the flow servers or the different uh, elements participated via unicast or multicast. Hmm? Uh, they, he can deploy also uh, connectivity over IPv6, over IPv4. Hmm? Uh, today, in the, all those transition scenarios, this creates a big mess. He can also deploy, for example, IPsec to have secure collaboration. And all this is managed from this centralized element. Hmm? So uh, this is why we call it something like a collaboration grid. The, the language we use for, to, to support this deployment is XIDL. This is uh, an acronym which stands for XML Even Definition Language, uh, which is a language in which we have a complete representation of all the platform such that with this model you can deploy, you can start, stop, and do whatever you want with any of the elements of the platform. Then this has a set of associated tools which now uh, have been implemented as XML RPC calls hmm, and services, but which we are now uh, remaking in web services, uh, which allow you to make the deployment hmm, and also the, the stop of, of, of the platform. Hmm. So this is basically uh, the view we have about what Isabel uh, should provide. So it should be, we could say, a technology which allows you to create collaboration platform within a population of resources and configure them as needed for, uh, for realizing the collaborations you need. Mm. Well, uh, to conclude, um, I would uh, say that we think that the main contribution of all this uh, long period of work, it's 11 years from now, is the Isabel service concept. We have developed this concept uh, for several years Users who participate in these conferences, they like it very much. They like it much more than standard uh, video chats or, or video conferencing like you have in H323 or the m tools. Or, um, uh, what we don't have clear yet is what is the best way to implement it. If it, the best way is doing it with a peer-to-peer -peer or grid-like way of doing it or doing it in a server-based way. We are doing experiments in this direction now because, well, this is one of the question marks we have. Hmm? Each of one has its own uh, benefits and disadvantages. Hmm? Uh, Isabel has proven very effective for distributed conference and meeting. I've shown you the examples. The users are quite uh, <coughs> happy with it. It's a very user-friendly concept. We have reached now a quite good uh, level of maturity. And now uh, we have also solved one of our traditional problems, which is network connectivity, broadband connectivity. We could develop this because we were working with the PDTs. I mean, we started in the framework of the PDTs with Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, British Telecom. And in the early times where the Internet had very, uh, a very low amount of bandwidth, well, they, put, uh, they made available to us enormous amount of, of bandwidth for that time. They're not so enormous for today, but then this is why we could develop it. Mm. Uh, we did for many times experiments with ITM, then we ported it to the Internet. And now that Giant, Internet2, Canary, and all the test pets have lots and lots of bandwidth, I think this is the time also when the, the technology has got ready and where it can be used. So uh, we have reached, we would like now to deploy it. If you are interested in using it, just get in contact with me and, well, we will help, let you know all what you can do with it and, and help you in, in using it if it, it needed. So that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have questions?
Yes, here in the front. Uh, yesterday we had a presentation on access grids. Um, could you explain a little bit what you see as the, as the differences between the access grid uh, presentation and uh, what Isabel is doing? Well, I think that ISAP, uh, the main difference, ISAP uh, access grid up to my knowledge uses M-Bone tools, uh, which basically provide uh, a video chat where, where you don't have this floor management. Mm -hmm. Uh, the main difference is that in ISAP, in, 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 uh, maybe you, uh, Ted will know much better than I, but you have basically a, a paradigm of, of communication, of presentation information, where you see just one video or you see it all. I think that in the access grid you see all the videos always. No? When you have 30 sites uh, and uh, 30 videos over it, it's very difficult to focus the attention on what are the active sites. Hmm? So the, this is uh, something we learned in, in, I think it was in 1996 when we made experiments and we had uh, professional TV producers, is that you must make something like TV production. So this is why we developed this scheme which makes something like a TV production which show to all the participants just the active sites. Hmm? So I think that Isabel is much more effective in having multi-point collaborations. In point, by po point to point is more or less the same. We have also a more integrated management and this makes the deployment and the start and the stop of all the tools uh, much quicker and much more effective. So the collaboration is, is, is much more uh, straightforward. I think that in the access grid you have to deploy one tool after the other, and this makes the collaboration uh, well, less fluent, I would say. But I am not very familiar with it. <coughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay, in the back. You mentioned, you mentioned that the bandwidth was a, a, a You mentioned the bandwidth was you know, Can you hear me? Yes, no, yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that bandwidth was a, an issue and uh, you got help from Telefonica at the beginning. And now with Geont, you should have lots of bandwidth. So how much bandwidth does a particular site need? And how much bandwidth does the master site need? Sorry, this is not, sorry. Uh, these platforms you have, the, the, <laughs> is adjusted such that on each link you have just a bandwidth which does not exceed a limit. So what we, when we define the platform, we say this will be a session, for example, with uh, 512 kilobits per second. Mm -hmm. And uh, so on, on any of those uh, links, uh, well, you will not have an, an average which is over this limit. It's usually under, depending on the mode, can be quite under, one half or even one third of the maximum bandwidth. So, and the sessions, we have modes which work 128 kilobits per second till uh, five megabits per second. I mean, in Canary, CRC is using it for making very advanced experiments with music. They have something called the music grid where they would like to have, the, they wanted to have CD-like uh, audio quality and the best, and so we adapted one which is above, consumes about five megabits per second or 10 megabits even at some points. Um, my question is, is it possible to, to archive such a session with, with the video and maybe also the slides? Uh, we have not automated the process of making an ar automatic archive. I mean, the recorder basically generates a file and, and puts it there. But this is one of our planned developments, to have an automatic system which automatic, I mean, we usually publish a couple of hours after all the videos because they are there, you have to put them in, in a directory which is accessible over the web and they can be downloaded. It's not difficult to do, but we have not a specific tool for, for making this automatic uh, classification, but it could be done without any problem. Hmm? In, in fact, for example, here, if you go to this, this URL here on the bottom, here we have this archive made accessible over the web of the complete workshop. Hmm? 
You have the presentations, some accompanying document, and all the videos in defects. Could you tell us how easy it is to set up and um, licensing? Um, how about licensing? Well, I mean, uh, this is, um, I mean, we, we usually make the following distribution. I mean, we created a, a, a university spin-off for commercializing it. Hmm? And so we have two schemes. I mean, one scheme is the commercial distribution for companies. And another thing is the, the research usage. Hmm? So for research users, we are quite free. Uh, we give evaluation languages for, for a period to any institution who is willing to, to experiment with it. We have not uh, published it and announced it very much in the past because we were still evolving it. Mm? But now, I mean, uh, we are announcing it, we like to be used. So if you are interested, just ask for evaluation language. We can give them for a sufficient period such that you can evaluate. And we can also negotiate quite good prices for, for large bunches of, of research uh, licenses. I mean, if you have a project where you need uh, 40 or 50 or 100 licenses, for example, like the Canadian thing that we can make, uh, very special arrangements, uh, which may be not free, if, uh, or maybe an arrangement where we receive benefits from both sides and we could even have an exchange. Uh, the rule we follow, for example, in all the research projects where we participate and we make experiments, hmm, then we provide all the licenses needed absolutely for free. Hmm. So, for example, in Euro 6, where we participate and in other projects, we have uh, <laughs> given, well, near 200 licenses uh, just to experiment within the project. Huh? Well, yeah, uh, the other question. I mean, the application is running on Linux. We are now developing a Windows version, but it is not ready. So what we have uh, now is, uh, as Linux is not easy to set up in certain environments, in universities usually you have experts, but not in all, then we have created a CD uh, which installs Linux, uh, everything needed, and Isabel. So it's quite easy to set up. Hmm? Now, if, if Linux detects the hardware, pro, it's, it's SUSE Linux distribution, the one we are supporting very heavily. We are uh, thinking providing support also for Red Hat because there are many Red Hat users. Hmm? So with the CD, it's very easy. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Doing a, a quick change here and introduce our next speaker, who is Alan Ruddle, who is a lecturer at St. Andrews University, who is going to talk about the European uh, learning grid infrastructure. Okay, as I said, my name's uh, Alan Ruddle from St. Andrews, um, and I'm going to talk about ELEGI, which is um, entitled, or short for, the Europe European Learning Grid Infrastructure, which is an a EU project, and the aim of the project is um, developing software technologies uh, to support effective uh, learning 
um, and providing and promoting uh, paradigm shift within the context of that within the context of that learning. So what I want to do in this talk is four things, really. Um, first of all, to kind of outline what the motivation and the goals are of the project. Uh, and the project has just started. Um, and then look at some of the activities that we are going to be engaged in over the next um, few years. And then look at a demonstrator which maybe will illustrate some of the issues that we hope to come to terms with. Um, and finally, look at some issues connected with monitoring and adaptation for uh, e-learning applications. Okay, so the motivation really starts off from a recognition or an observation that the kind of main paradigm that exists within uh, e-learning is similar to a paradigm which exists um, in the learning environments generally, which is the kind of conventional one of information transfer, of information transfer that there is a teacher that is at the center of the uh, learning process and is the kind of key authoritative figure and the process that takes place, or is aiming to take place, is to provide content and facilitate transfer of information from the teacher um, to, the, to the learners. And that this kind of model is mirrored very closely in most learning environments that exist, and in general has its technical uh, mirror in the web, whereby often it is the case that you can facilitate the placement of um, content of multimedia books or whatever, which at which students then can gain uh, access to. Um, but we kind of propose or suggest that this paradigm or this approach is popular um, for three main reasons. First of all, it's easy to implement with existing um, technology. Secondly, that it doesn't involve a challenge or a change in the traditional relationships that exist um, in when people are engaged in learning. And thirdly, because it is well understood and supported. But the, those three um, reasons why the approach is popular um, don't correspond with saying that it is the best possible way for people to be engage in learning. And so one of the aims of the project is to promote another um, paradigm which sees the learner as being at the centre of the learning process and sees the process of learning as being one whereby the learner comes to the um, learning process with a set of experiences um, and a set of understandings of the world or of the topic that is under, under, under study um, and is able to, through active um, learning techniques to construct an understanding or to deepen their understanding of the environment that they're in and of the topic that they're wanting to um, engage with. Now clearly this process would, contain, would contain within it um, the transfer of information, but the argument really is that, 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 that the information transfer content um, isn't the main goal, but is a, simple, um, is a simple component of it. So that's kind of the educational approach that we're attempting to um, adopt. The project itself is a Framework 6 integrated project, has 23 partners from eight countries. I had a slide with all of the um, different partners on it, but then was trying to get the number of slides on, down to a reasonable number and um, deleted it and have regretted it since then. But some of the people that are, some of the um, organizations that are involved include the university, the Open University in the UK, the University of Southampton, Montpellier University, France, Microsoft, the University of Stuttgart, um, the Hellenic University here in um, Greece, CRSA in France, and Telindus in, uh, in Belgium. Okay. 
So um, for a kind of constructive approach to learning, constructive approach to learning, what, does it, what are the features that are uh, important for us? Um, well, I think the first is, is that uh, having a concept of the learning process being one that is facilitated through direct experience um, in real life circumstances or as close to real life circumstances as possibly, possible. Secondly, the, the learning is a social process which involves interaction between a number of different actors between a number of different actors and that in turn um, implies uh, collaboration, sometimes complex, colla sometimes complex collaboration, but at the same time as it being a social and collaborative process, it also being a process um, which needs to be and should be personalised to suit the individual um, requirements of the people who, who are engaging um, in that process. And that leads to a number of uh, requirements or a number of approaches that we're things that we're trying to do um, in the electronic domain. Um, firstly, the, we want to build um, learning environments that are based around collaboration, um, and so they need to facilitate group work um, routinely, um, and it should be easy to form um, dynamic virtual communities that change. Secondly, that needs to be experi experiential um, so that the le learner is, genu is genuinely involved in the process um, and, can, uh, and therefore it needs to be an interactive process. Thirdly, we want the process to be realistic, which means making use of real-world input um, so that can, so real world input can be incorporated in the learning environment, personalized, as I said before, um, an important uh, aspect is that we want to have generalized accessibility. So we do not take the assumption that um, everybody is going to be located in a particular place. We want to be able to support access for a range of different, um, different, different places and different positions. Um, and that this in turn, then if we were trying to achieve these things, this has <coughs> implication for the technical requirements that the, uh, project, that the project has. So the, for the group working, um, one, it implies having interactive resources, um, and secondly, you know, issues of concur concurrency control may arise. The, for the um, experiential and for the realism, the responsiveness is, in, is important, that um, people become disengaged with learning environments if they have to wait long periods of time to get a reaction to the input that they're, that they're using. Similarly, with real-world input, um, issues of quality of service arise um, in terms of the quality of the network connection and network connectivity, particularly in the context where we can't make assumptions about um, how it is that people are connecting or where they, they are able to um, connect from. Um, and that applies also for the point of view of uh, access, accessibility. So um, one of the aspects of the project is to uh, leverage upon uh, technologies that have come about as a result of the, of the grid. Now, typically, um, the grid is associated with e-science and supercomputing uh, applications, so clearly the environment that we'll be working in um, maybe won't have the, the advantages or we cannot take for granted the advantages of um, a, either the scale of resource or the scale of, um, of, connect, of connectivity. But nonetheless, the development of OGSA Open Grid Services Architecture, which is aimed at facilitating um, heterogeneous resources being brought together um, and the basis of for the basis of collaboration, um, we want to leverage those uh, technologies in particular um, for three aspects. The first aspect is to have a service orientated approach to the development of um, learning resources so that that can in turn support a conversational process and interac interactions. Um, secondly, we want to develop distributed collaboration 
and thirdly, have the ability to put together um, virtual, or virtual organizations. And the use of open architecture and open standards should help. I mean, for example, there are a number of different learning and resources that have been developed which embody um, the approach that we've talked about so, so far. Um, the use of open architecture and standards um, facilitates the bringing of, together um, of those. So this slide kind of uh, illustrates some of the activities that we're going to be uh, engaged in. And what I want to focus on is just to mention um, the uh, columns at the side, the SEES and demos, the service elex elex elicitation and exploitation scenarios, um, and the demonstrators. So the, the C's um, are about being able to place the, uh, con the learning environments that we build um, within the context of um, environments where they can be um, tested and that they can be evaluated, um, but not in a strictly experimental way, um, in the sense that they'll be incorporated into um, real learning environments. So some of the ones that are going to be used are there's an e-qualification by the Open University, um, there's a physics course in the Open University that is going to be uh, using it. Um, there's a master ICT course um, which AIT in Greece runs in collaboration with the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and there's also learning and training um, of researchers uh, in organic chemistry. So there's a number of scenarios within which we're going to be working. Um, and at the same time as that, there's a number of demonstrators which are learning resources which have been developed prior to the project that are going to be um, re-engineered to be consistent with the architecture that we're talking about, but that they are learning resources which have embodied in them the idea of encouraging collaborative and active um, learning techniques. And three, the three that we have are virtual scientific um, experiments which are aimed for higher level mathematics, learning environment for accountancy and business, and also a learning environment for mechanical uh, engineering. And in the, by using these, we hope to provide evidence of the benefit of the approach um, being taken and also come to understand in the process of the project some of the engineering issues that are involved. So that's a bit of an overview of the um, project itself. One, an example of the uh, demonstrators is a learning environment which is called um, Finesse. Uh, Finesse stands for Finance Education in a Scalable Software Environment. And what it does is it supports the teaching of fund management. So you have virtual portfolios that are at the core of it. Um, and groups can buy and sell shares uh, against this portfolio. The data is taken from the London Stock Exchange. So your people are trading, in real, are trading against real um, movements in the stock exchange. Um, and that there's mechanisms whereby you can inspect and look at the historic data and so on. Most communication in the group work scenario um, is currently done through a notebook, so it's, a, so it's asynchronous. So the kind of re-engineering that is going to take place is to, first of all, re-engineer finesse um, to make use of the grid service architecture, um, to introduce synchronous communication um, and also to look at uh, device uh, independence. And so this is a kind of uh, uh, sl a slide which on, on the right-hand side it shows you a kind of a current finesse page, what people would see and how they would um, buy and sell shares. And on the left illustrates perhaps the enhanced presence that they're looking to um, achieve. One of the advantages or one of the things that we're aiming to achieve um, in using grid services is to be able to break out the different kind of component parts um, of the resource so that they can be used more, used, used more widely and made use of by other institutions so that, for instance, the portfolio tool could stand alone or the conferencing could be seen um, alone and so on. So there we have a, a, a starting point architecture we want to achieve. Um, there are kind of technical implications which 
arise. And one of the issues that I want to address is the question of um, quality of service and how we go about um, achieving it. Um, because although we have high-speed networks at the core of the network, um, as kind of technology progresses, it means that in a sense there's a greater disparity grows, uh, that people experience a greater range of um, access technologies from uh, low bandwidth through um, telephones, through, um, through portable phones, through people st you know, using modem access, through to high, high bandwidth uh, uh, access. Um, so there's a number of different approaches to uh, quality of service that can be uh, adapted, that can be used. The one that we want to focus on is the idea of using adaptive quality of service so that the applications can um, know what it is, that, what the characteristics of the connection that somebody is connecting with um, is likely to be. Um, and this has the advantage of it being able to deploy it at the edge of the network. Um, and this has two advantages. One is that as network connectivity increases and becomes better, then it is possible to make, take, take use of, make use of that. But at the same time that where bottlenecks exist, it is possible to be able to adapt to them. Um, and so a number of different ways in which we can go about finding out how the, uh, what the quality of service is on a network or that a particular user is likely to um, receive. Um, what we want to do is we want to integrate this with the grid monitoring um, architecture. Currently, um, applications like a network uh, weather station, which is able to uh, pro provide a view of what is going on on the network, um, use active techniques of um, probing the network and firing information down TCP connections. Um, we have two kind of problems with that. One is the question of scalability. The, you know, if you do, do want lots of applications at the edge, firing lots of different probes into the internet as a whole, it will work well when you've got a small number of um, sites on well-connected links, but maybe won't scale to the rest of the internet as a whole. Um, and secondly, the if you could build up, a, if you fire in probes, you can build up, build up a picture of how those probes are being treated and the quality of service that those probes get, but that may not be the same as the quality of service that the traffic that your users are experiencing are going to get as well. So that, for instance, if you're firing small probes, you may actually be measuring the behavior of um, the TCP slow start algorithm rather than the behavior that you'd expect for a more long-lived long -lived connection. Um, so what we want to do is to use passive monitoring um, techniques, perhaps leveraging on some of the technologies developed and looked at in the uh, SCAMPI uh, project um, and look at the traffic that has taken place in the past, leveraging the locality that we expect to exist between um, users coming into and using network in a similar way over a period of time um, and build up a picture of past traffic and use that to make predictions about what is going to happen in the future and then from that be able to adapt our application in different ways in order to um, make the best use of the resources that are actually available. So, for instance, one example might be um, instead of firing a um, high bandwidth PDF file to somebody that's going to take 20 minutes to download it, converting it into a text file so that they get um, you know, the essence of what is in the document in a, much shorter period, in a much shorter period of time. Okay, there would be some degradation in terms of the information that is going, but at least the person at the other end would, um, re would, re would receive that. And so this is a kind of conceptual framework for how we would achieve that. And the essential idea is to mo passively monitor traffic that is traveling across the network to um, have a state machine which clocks what is happening in each TCP connection. And by do doing that, we are then able to extract the feedback which the network is giving anyway in terms of loss 
or explicit congestion notification, the feedback that is coming from routers, but instead of it being kind of existing within the context of a single TCP connection and then being thrown away, um, being able to capture that so that it can be used at some stage, it's used in the future. Um, and having captured that state or that information about what's going on on the network, um, then saving it in a location layer where we aggregate together IP addresses that we would expect to have and to experience um, similar, similar behavior. Um, so that's how we want to, to find out what is going on in the network. Um, this is an example of a conference control architecture where when the conference is set up, we hope to be able to use information from the traffic data repository to be able to configure the conference um, so that uh, it uses resources, the resource usage of the conference is in line with the resource availability that users, that we expect users um, to have. So really to round off, the three main goals of the project the kind of central focuses of the project are to define um, new models of human learning, to enable collaboration and uh, collaboration in contextualized approaches. Um, secondly, to define and implement a service-based, uh, orientated, grid-based architecture to support that. Um, within that, there may be quality of service issues, but there also are, that I chose to spoke on, speak on but there are a range of other issues that will need to be addressed. Um, and thirdly, to validate and evaluate the software that is developed um, in real-world scenarios um, and also using demonstrators that we have already developed. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions. This um, may sound like a um, <clears throat> question from me, but um, you've talked about learning resources and you said the finesse and the stock exchange uh -huh. information. Are libraries going to be integrated anyway into the grid learning system? Yes. Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, in, in the sense that um, the kind of architecture that we developed um, would, we would want to be able to support those sort of, those sort of resources and know in the sense that, like, out of the, out of the seven examples that we've got at the moment, um, there isn't a specific one for a library there. So, Let me ask one. Have you looked at OGSA to see if there are holes in the architecture related to e-learning compared to, you know, its orientation towards, you know, computation? Well... We have looked at it, um, and kind of the, the biggest concern that we have is what the implications are going to be for um, performance. The, you know, if, if doing SOAP over HTML and all of this stuff, if somebody is wanting to have an interactive experience over a modem, whether it's actually going to, um, whether it's going to hold up. Although there are, within OGS, obviously, there's, there's different ways in which we can, you could do it. You, um, so we can look... You could put SOAP over TCP IP and cut out the HTML, but then that has implications in terms of accessibility through the, through the web. So, yes, we would expect to find, you know, in the process of the project, to come up against a number of um, problems um, and hopefully find solutions to them or we'll look at the different trade-offs that are involved. Put more performance Yes. Well, because really the, the starting point for a lot of the um, resources that we have is that of the web. So moving on to OGSO is a clear plus, really, in, all, all the way across the ground in terms of functionality. Any other questions? Yes, up front. Um, I, I maybe did not understand fully the uh, the, the the grid part in uh, in um, in the LG uh, project. Um, 
Uh, is it more than uh, several different applications to be developed from, by different partners um, available from different sites? Um, because uh, I, I, I learned that you, have a, you are developing several uh, pedagogically sound uh, applications. Uh, and I suppose that that's being done by different partners each where you were, you were, you were talking about the Open University who has a, a course and uh, another university who has, uh, so, uh, has a course. But what is, it, what is precisely the grid part in, 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 the, um, in the LEG project? I don't know how I did that. Um, so I think the, the kind of focus at the start of the project is to take, certainly at the site that I'm involved in, is to take the learning resource that we have and engineer it so that it's grid compliant in the sense that it is able to make use of the OXA infrastructure and to look at technologies and to look at how that, what implications that has. So what we then hope is that in doing that, what we will then end up with is a number of different um, resources that are engineered in similar ways. Um, and then at a later stage in the project, we can uh, ad address the question of how is it possible to build virtual organizations and how it's possible to integrate those. So that, for instance, if we have um, a number of different resources from each of the different um, uh, partners, that are um, OGSA compliant, then we should be able to then build an all, a kind of all-encompassing framework that these can then, that these can then fit into um, so that uh, different people, so, so that the, yeah, the aim is to get to the situation where we've no longer got a set of isolated kind of pedagogically sound resources, but that these resources are able to um, talk to each other or to be integrated together into, um, into different courses. Well, I just uh, want to make sure we now thank all three of our speakers for this afternoon's presentations on e-learning. <laughs> and remind you all that the buses are leaving immediately after the close of this session unless you're staying for the BOF. So uh, you may want to head directly for the buses to get to the gala evening tonight. <laughs>